welcome in this place. Those of you that are at home, why don't you join us in worship right now? Would you stand to your feet with us? Would you lift up your hands and lift up your voice to our God? Lord, we bless you and we magnify you, Jesus. You are worthy of praise and glory. We exalt your name, O God, and we lift you up, Jesus. You alone are worthy, O God. We bless you. We magnify you. You are great, O God. Hallelujah. We bless your mighty name, Jesus. We exalt you. We've come to give you praise, Lord. We've come to lift you up. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are holy, O oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we welcome you in this house, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. Nothing excites us like Jesus. In his presence is free. So we give to him the highest praise. It's the greatest feeling when you feel his praise. In this moment, you are moving as we give you praise. Come right now, Holy Spirit, release your power. Lord, we are hungry for more. Here comes the sound of rejoicing. My happiness is restored. So give to Him the highest praise. It's the greatest feeling when you feel this place. In this moment, you are moving.
exalt you. We magnify you, oh God. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Come on, would you invite him in right now? Come on, invite him in. God, we want your presence. We want your spirit, oh God, to surround us. Hallelujah. You are worthy, God. Because you're beautiful, beautiful. That's what you want with me. Beautiful, beautiful in every way you want. could ever describe you, and nobody could ever compare, I can't stop thinking about you, Jesus, oh, oh, oh. you can search the world for something that's greater.
ring in your life. Say, We glorify you, God. You are mighty, oh God. You are worthy. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for your blood. Thank you, Jesus, that you've covered us, oh God. Every shame, oh God, every guilt that we've carried, Lord, you've erased it. You've buried it, oh God, through your love and mercy and the blood, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. You are so worthy, God. You are so mighty, God. Hallelujah. Come on, can you thank him for what he's done in your life? Because nobody knows how much he's done for you like you know how much he's done for you. God, I thank you, Jesus. You are so good, God. I bless you.
nations all rising, rising and fall, and your world, world. And we are responding to your
or two or three would gather together saying, I still believe he's the same God. I still believe he's the same healer. Nothing too much. Tell him, say, my God, how great you are. prayer. Amen. Our God is awesome. Amen. He is. Thank you, Jesus. I hope y'all are feeling him at home like we're feeling him here. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We want to go to God in prayer. There will be some names on the screen. Remember to pray for those. Amen. There are details beside them if we're praying for salvation or for healing. 
or whatever their situation may be. We want to continue to lift them up. Ask that God would minister to each and every one of them. We want to continue to lift up Sister Murphy's parents, brother and sister Shepherd, that God would be with them, especially her dad. Um, he is not doing very well. They did manage to get him into another facility rather than the nursing home he was in. Um, and they feel a lot better about it. It's actually a Christian director that is there um, and has taken personal interest in Brother Shepherd. And so it's a, a really good thing. He's giving Sister Murphy some peace about it. But we want to continue to lift that family up, lift Sister Murphy up and everything that she's having to deal with, with taking care of this and all these responsibilities. Um, so pray for them that God would minister strength and peace and just be merciful in this time. I want to continue to lift up Carly Mixel, who is dealing with the uh, virus, that God would minister healing also for Brother Scotty for complete healing in his body, that his esophagus would completely heal um, and he wouldn't have to have any type of surgery. So let's continue to lift him up. Also for Sister Erica, she's going to have to possibly have a surgery as well. I believe God's able to intervene, amen, and rebuke everything that would cause that. But we want to pray that God would minister, keep his hand upon her, um, that the doctors would be wise as far as everything that's going on so that she doesn't have any chances of getting any other infection during this time. Let's pray for that also for Elder Brother Sibley for complete healing. Um, also going to have to have another surgery possibly, so let's pray that God would intervene in that and also just be with him and give the doctors wisdom as well. Continue to lift up Ryan Wolford. Um, he will be deployed to Iraq in a few months. want to pray that God would protect him. Remember all of those that have been dealing with this virus. There have been many extended church families that have been touched by this. Some have lost their pastors or pastor's wives or ministers within their congregation or just family members within their congregation, three and five um, in some churches. And so we want to pray that God would minister peace and strength to those families, to those church families, amen, to those pastors trying to minister to those families during this time. Um, just want to pray that God would rebuke this virus. There are some that need a miracle from God. We've got some ministers that are still suffering with this, some who God has touched already and they've gone home from the hospital. We give God praise for that. Amen. But those that are still suffering with it, we want to continue to lift them up. Amen. That God would minister through his miraculous power and lift them up and give them a miracle. Amen. If you need prayer and you're here tonight, um, or you would like a prayer call or want to be anointed, uh, our ministry team will come and do that. I believe we're anointing a prayer call for Sister Yolanda's uh, boss's wife. We're going to be praying over that in a few moments. So if you need prayer, we will definitely anoint you, pray with you. Our, our ministry team will come and do that. Those of you that are at home, if you have a special need, why don't you just signify by lifting up your hand. You may have somebody there with you that would have faith and join in prayer. But if not, we're going to join with you. We're joining together right now. Church, can we lift up our voices? Let's go to God right now in faith, believe. And Lord, we come to you and we ask that you would minister in this place. God, you see every need, oh God. I pray, Lord, that you would minister in homes right now, God. Those that are sick, those that have situations, I pray, God, that you would minister to every circumstance. God, you know each and every situation. You know every need, oh God, to the very detail. And we ask, oh God, that you would minister right now. Bring salvation. Bring healing, oh God. Bring deliverance, Lord. You see every name, oh God, that is on the screen. Those that are in need of salvation. Those that are in need of protection. Those that need a miracle from you, oh God. I pray, Lord, for healing. I ask God for deliverance. We pray, God, that you would touch Sister Erica. Minister healing in her body. Rebuke the pain. Rebuke the cause of the pain, oh God. I'm asking that you would minister in a mighty way in her body. Touch Elder Brother Sibley today. I ask God that you would minister strength in his body and give wisdom, oh Lord, to the doctors during this time. We pray, God, for Brother Scotty. Asking you, Lord, to lift him up to minister strength in his body and healing. Touch Brother and Sister Shepherd, oh God. Cover them right now, Lord, in this time. Give Sister Murphy strength, oh God, and touch Brother Murphy right now. We ask, oh Lord, that you would lift them up and that you cover them, God, with your power. Cover them, oh God, with your strength and with your mercy, God. You are able, Lord, and we ask, oh God, that you would do a mighty work. Minister, God, to our church families, Lord, that have dealt with this virus, God. Those that have suffered losses, those that have family members still in the hospital, we ask, God, that you would cover them right now. Rebuke the virus, God. Rebuke the sickness, oh God, and lift them up, God. Every infection, oh God, every effect of it, God, that you would minister healing and that you would rebuke it right now. We ask, oh God, that you would cover them. We pray, God, that you would give peace and strength, oh Lord. We know that you are able. We ask, God, that you would cover every job situation. You see those, oh God, that have lost their jobs during this time. And we pray, God, that you would open up doors. You would make a way, oh God, even that seems impossible. Even when it seems that there is no way, you are able, God. And we ask it in your name right now, Jesus. We ask it in your name and we believe and we trust in you. Come on, can you lift up your hands? Can you lift up your voice and thank him right now? God, you are able. You're our healer. You're our strength, oh God. You're our provider. You're our deliverer, God. You are a way maker. We trust in you, Lord, and we believe you, God. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we thank you and we bless you, Jesus. You are great and mighty. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Yes, God. You are able, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. In order to have a miracle, we have to have a need. Amen. We just don't like to be the one that's in need. Amen. But God is able. I'm believing that every situation, amen, that we have faced during this time, everything that has come against any of you, that God is going to take care of it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity right now to give those of you that are here. If you would like to bring your tithe and offering, you can go ahead and do that. Those of you that are our Jesus Church family and you're watching from home, you can go to the Jesus Church website, www.thejesuschurch.cc. You can give to online donations. Click that little button. It'll walk you through what you need to do. You can also mail it in physically. You can get that address off of the website as well. Um, and so if you would like to do that, you can do that. If you would like to bring it physically, you can come physically to the church. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm just kidding. You can't because it's Sunday night for you. You missed that. You could have come today from one to two, but you missed out on that. So you just have to mail it. Amen. If Yes, you should have watched Sunday morning. The problem is most of you watch Sunday morning and they're not watching Sunday night. So send this to somebody that you know only comes to church on Sunday morning. Those of you that are here can be seated. Amen. I don't even know what day of the week it is. I'm not even sure what month it is. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's Corona. That's all I know, right? So um, it's Corona the 35th or something like that. It's been too long. That's what it is. Amen. Uh, but you can give so you can do that. You know how to do that. Um, so take care of that. If you need updates or you have questions, you don't know what's going on, please check your email. If you're in the Breeze system, we are sending out emails. It has come to my attention that some of you aren't reading those, and that's why you don't know what's going on. So please read that. Read it all the way down. It's not the same thing every time pastor is giving you new information. So please check your email. We also post that information on the website and on our church Facebook page. So if you would like to have updates on anything, you can check that out. And if still that doesn't help you, we will send out smoke signals. So text us or call us and we'll update you on that. Uh, teacher appreciation is coming up. Actually, the first week of May, our kids are not going back to school. I understand that. But we have always done a huge show of affection to our teachers um, in the Medina Valley School District. And we would like to do something uh, since we've always done something huge. We're not going to do as big as we have before. But we would like to give them thank you cards. So if you could have your kids start writing some thank you cards this week. We've got all of this week. And then um, the first week of May, we'll start trying to get those delivered in some way. We'll probably try try to put a box up here in some form or fashion, a drop box that you can just put those cards in there. Don't put money in the cards. That way people won't steal them. It's just a thank you card. Okay. So just have your kids write a thank you card. Just very basic. And we will divide those up, distribute them among all of the school campuses. So help us out with that. Get your kids and your family, start writing some cards, bring those up. If you have questions, you can text me. Amen. Thank you. Amen. We appreciate our first lady. Clap your hands. The few that are here. We got a few hand claps. I appreciate you. Amen. Good to be in God's house on whatever day it is and whatever time you're watching this. It's glad to be here. And those that have made a point to be here and in this recording, we're grateful you are here. And I'm looking forward to things returning to a little bit of normal. Somebody say amen. And so this morning I addressed a couple of things and I'll just quickly recap some of those here that uh, Texas is slowly opening up. I appreciate I want to go on record as saying that I appreciate Governor Abbott's leadership uh, in the state of Texas, and he has given very clear leadership. And then uh, Bishop Bernard, uh, my my general superintendent, has also has connections uh, with people in Governor Abbott's office and also a little bit higher up, even on the federal level. And he's been in contact, giving us guidance. And so this coming week, um, next Wednesday night, we will do another Parable in Matthew series via video. Um, but in the meantime, between now and then, we will have met and decided a course of action of how to approach May. We are currently in phase zero until April is over, which means we keep doing what we're doing. But then once May hits, uh, it's going to move to phase one and then phase two. And um, so we will begin uh, to have services in May, probably the first or second week in some sort of fashion. Uh, it may be a little different than full throttle. We may have to take uh, and split up so that certain people are at certain services. So we don't have an excess and we have space. We will abide by all the guidelines 
and uh, uh, participate with Governor Abbott's guidelines and also our president and CDC. But um, as soon as they let us start opening up, we will do our best to be back in church in May in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. So again, uh, Facebook page, The Jesus Church, or our website, thejesuschurch.cc, or if your name's Sister Eliza, you can just check your email and you will find all of the, uh, all of the, I'm just having a little fun. So uh, remember all these things. We'll try to keep you updated this coming week as far as a plan. And I appreciate all of those that have been faithful in giving, uh, the people that have been willing to come sing and willing to sanitize the church between these services and wipe down everything. Uh, it's not gone unnoticed and we appreciate you. And uh, to God be the glory for all he's doing. Amen. I believe that once it kicks back in, the end of May is Pentecost Sunday. It gives us something to celebrate. We'll have, a, we'll have another Easter. You can celebrate Easter year round. We may do Easter and 4th of July. We'll have fireworks for Easter. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Um, we'll do some kind of combination. We can, we can Cinco de Mayo and Pentecost Sunday and Easter all rolled into one. And a communion service, we'll reschedule that as soon as we're able to. And I appreciate my church family. Reach out, be the, be the body of Christ, and don't die spiritually. Reach out to somebody if you need someone to pray to and talk to, and uh, you know who to call. Somebody say amen. Pray with. Did I say pray to? You should know who to pray to as well. You can always call him. His name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. The beauty of these recordings. All right, let's go into the word of the Lord. And uh, those of you that are here, let's, you'll stand with me and at home. If you're watching on a Sunday night, it counts whether your hair is done or not. Sunday night church counts whether or not you got shoes on, whether or not you, I'd hopefully you brushed your teeth by now. I'm just saying by the time this video goes live. But if you're watching this, it counts whether you have popcorn or not. All, all the perimeters are off for Sunday night church. Somebody say amen. Amen. We're turning in the Bible to Joshua chapter 1 verse 7 and also the book of Proverbs chapter 3 verse 1. Joshua chapter 1 verse 7, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 1. You kind of have to keep a sense of humor in all this craziness or else go crazy. And uh, I do appreciate the fact that God has kept our local church somewhat safe from this. And um, I know there are some financial situations and job situations. I'm believing that God is going to be the God he always has been, that COVID-19 or Corona or Bologna or anything else can't change him, and uh, he is still going to be faithful. Amen? Amen. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, and then also the book of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. Joshua chapter 1 and 7 reads this. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Say it with me. Say, good success. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Everybody say day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then, here it is again, you will have good success. Look at somebody next to you, or if you're by yourself, look at the cat and say, good success. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, the master teacher is teaching the student, Matt, and I don't know who that is, but the master is speaking. And Proverbs 3 and 1 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Everybody say commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Now my mom used to quote that to me when I was growing up. But she meant something a little different. That if I would keep her commandments, I would live a little longer. And I think she was implying that if I didn't keep her commandments... My life was fixing to be extremely short, but that's not what it's saying. Verse 3 says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And why do you do these things in verse 4? Here it is. So you will find favor. Somebody say it with me. Say favor. And good success 
in the sight of God and man. Now I hope you don't want to be a failure. I hope you want to be a success. But I hope after this service you're going to want to be a good success. Somebody say amen. 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 Let's ask the Lord to help us today. Lord, we glorify you. We praise you. We ask God for your blessing. We ask God for your purpose. We ask God that you would speak to us, God, in this service. We pray, God, that this word, oh God, would fall on good ground. And in the name of Jesus, minister God to people, God, no matter where they see this, I pray, God, that, oh Lord, your spirit and apostolic truth would, God, come into their life. God, that your spirit would change and transform lives. Uh, In Jesus' name, let us be a blessed people. Let us be a blessed people, oh God, and let it be in our life as your word is spoken. And we pray these things in the precious, matchless name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord. He's worthy. Hallelujah. We worship you. We glorify you. We honor you, Lord. We praise you, oh Lord. We submit to you, oh God. Amen. I want to preach to you from this subject. You may be seated, those that are here. Finding good success. Can there be such thing as a bad success? I guess if the Bible can speak of the existence of good successes, then it also has to be spiritually possible to have a bad success. I would say that human experience in everyday life has shown us the reality that there is such a thing as a bad success. Success. A bad success is when you're successful at something that yet leads you away from God. Or you're successful, but then your success leads you into a life that destroys you into things that debase you. Those are, those are examples, I guess. Uh, you could think of a successful actor or maybe a millionaire uh, heiress who yet becomes a drug addict or an atheist or someone who becomes so smart they don't even believe that there is a God who gave them their first breath and they forget the God of their youth. Uh, that would be, uh, you can have more degrees than a thermometer and be so stupid you don't even believe in God. Can I get a witness? Uh, that would be an example of a bad success that that they were successful and they obtained the things that the world perhaps uh, labels as a success but because of what it brings about in the end of the matter it really wasn't anything good about it the Bible says Jesus himself said a person can gain the whole world uh, and yet lose their soul uh, and in the words of Jesus uh, what does it then profit a man it doesn't really profit anything uh, if I have everything the world has to offer uh, and yet lose out uh, on eternal life. And so the Bible in human history is full of examples of people who became wealthy, people who became learned, people who became extremely proficient at something skillful, and there's nothing really wrong with those three things. Uh, but there are examples throughout history in the Bible of people who let those things uh, lead them away from things uh, that really mattered. Uh, how many self self-made men yet have broken families and fractured relationships with their children and the wife of their youth at the end of their life. It's it's very, very common to have bad success. How many people have devoted themselves to a craft or a field or a business or a talent or a career and yet in the end they utterly lost out with their relationship with God in the process. Uh, That would be a a definition example of a bad uh, 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 success. How many people have been like Solomon was of old uh, who are wise and mentally sharp who have all the resources seemingly in the world and yet it ends up taking them very, very far from the perfect will of God in their life. I just want to go on record as saying uh, if you're successful in life, uh, if you're successful by the things uh, that this world calls success, uh, but if it leads you away from what God God has called you to do uh, and his purpose for your life uh, then the world may crown you as a success uh, amen but if we really called it for what it really is uh, it's a bad success hallelujah how about the example of Lot who became something akin to the ancient equivalent he was basically kind of like the mayor of Sodom 
but yet it just set him and his family up uh, for judgment. Uh, that's an example of a bad success uh, because Lot used his God-given blessings, uh, his God-given wisdom and acumen to propel his entire family into a place where they would be devoured by the judgment of that place. How about Nimrod? who the Bible says was a mighty hunter and a leader, and yet he became a Nimrod. His, his, his name now colloquially means an idiot or a fool uh, because, uh, amen, that in a time where he was supposed to be a leader, he used his leadership proficiency uh, to take people apparently against the word of God. We forget in Genesis chapter 10 that the Bible says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord and seemingly gives him his kudos and his props uh, that he was destined to be a leader in a time where the ability to procure food was, was paramount and he was destined to be able to influence people and yet all the gifting and all of the things that God gave him, he used that leadership to take society in a way that was against the will of God, not toward it and thus became, became a, a Nimrod. Amen. Anything that leads people to judgment of God uh, by using the strengths and the gifting and the calling of God in a life uh, is by definition a bad success uh, again you can be successful in earthly terms uh, amen you can have people peeling grapes for you uh, and rubbing your little head with a little wax uh, cloth uh, and everything else uh, but if the world says you're a success and you lose out with the things of God and the will of God uh, it's not anything good about it uh, it's being badly successful we could go on and on with names of examples like this was Samson called of God was he a mighty man, Samson, who brought great victories against the enemy armies of the Philistines? Y'all are here. Y'all preaching me a little bit. By those standards, by military standards, by as far as victories, yes, uh, Samson was a success. But when you have to end your life by taking your life and the greatest victory uh, to bring about even a fraction of what God called you to do uh, causes you to self-destruct uh, because of your own foolishness. And if you end your life in an older age uh, without vision and without clear look on how things should be, uh, you may have had success, Samson, uh, but it was a bad success. Uh, we could add this list uh, names of kings, kings like King Saul and we could add names like prophets like Jonah we could add disciples like Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus after being chosen, being successfully chosen as one of the twelve. We could add Demas uh, who was a God called preacher in the time of Paul and yet after some success at ministry he chose the world uh, over the calling and the purpose and the kingdom of God. That all of these people that I have mentioned to you uh, achieved a measure of earthly success uh, and even some success perhaps in God's kingdom uh, but in the end uh, they can only be described uh, as a bad success. Uh, if you're going to be successful uh, be successful the right way uh, and not uh, the wrong way. So our text that we read, one in Joshua, one in the book of Proverbs, uh, they have in common this theme. Uh, they have in common that they both are teaching us uh, uh, not about bad success, uh, but they are teaching us what it takes uh, to have good success. Uh, and again, we've learned something very important, that successfulness in itself uh, is not the goal. Uh, it, it's not just all success is not created equal. Uh, it's not all success at any cost uh, but we want to be very specific uh, amen you want to have the ultimate plan in your life uh, it's not just be successful in life son uh, it's not just be successful in life woman uh, amen it's be godly successful uh, and be goodly successful uh, I don't want my life to end up like Samson or Jonah or Nimrod or Lot uh, where I sniffed and hinted uh, at what God could have done uh, but never see it come into fruition uh, but I want my life to be more like the likes of Joshua huh, who take the people into the promised land. Huh. If I've got to be like somebody, let me be like Daniel, huh, amen, in my world as he was in his. Huh. If I've got to find somebody, let me be like Simon Peter or the Apostle Paul huh, because those are men huh, who obtain good huh, and godly success. Huh. I want to be like David huh, who through all the drama huh, and through all the crazy happenstance huh, and through all the other success, huh, yet in the end, 
hand. It led him to being a man, amen, whose heart was like unto God's heart. If I've got to endure a great trial, then let me come through it like Job, who ended up with a double portion of God's favor and as a friend of God in the end. If I've got to endure persecution for my dreams to be a success, then I want to be like Joseph, who may have endured much at the hands of others, but in the end, his dreams came true, and in the end, God was able to exalt him, and in the end, God was able to bless him. Come on, somebody, I want to obey, amen, and every day, I want to get up and claim the promise. I want to obey the command of Scripture in Psalms chapter 118, chapter 118, verse 24 and 25. Psalms 118, 24 says this, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And then he says, verse 25, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. You ought to pray that every morning when you wake up, that I'm gonna approach this day with faith. No matter what's held over from yesterday, no matter what I've got to face today, no matter what's brooding or or, or brewing in the clouds, amen, or hanging over my life, I got faith that this is the day the Lord has made, and God, I want it to be a success. But I would say let's amend it, amen. We're not adding or taking away the scripture. We're letting one scripture interpret the other. Let's not pray that we just have success. But God, when success comes, let it be a good success. Let it be a godly success. Let it be a success that sets up truth and victory in my life. Hallelujah. Pray specifically. I don't want to just have full barnyards on this earth and not have treasure in heaven. I don't want to gain fame and acclaim in this world and yet not heaven not not know me and not have my name written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't want to make a name for myself in this world and yet not give glory and praise to the name that was called over me when I was baptized in the name of Jesus so many years ago. I don't want to have the Spirit of God equip me and fix me and change me and empower me to do things beyond my normal ability and then turn and prostitute those gifts in order to help me be successful and not bless his kingdom. God, I don't just want success. It's not success at any cost, but I want good success. I want godly success. I want something that thrust me into the will of God. I want something that matters in eternity. I want there to be a purpose. Oh God, we're praying for success. We're praying that our church would be successful, but we're not praying for a crowd at any cost. We're praying for apostolic, truth-filled, holiness-loving people. We're praying, God, for people, God, to be delivered from drugs and alcohol and sex and pornography. We're praying, God, oh, Lord, for delivering power, God, to fill our pews with people who are imperfect but who are justified by the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. We're praying, God, I want my ministry to be a success, but, God, that's not just to be famous. I don't want to be famous. It's not really to be rich. It's that, God, oh, Lord, when I go to heaven, there'd be a whole lot of people with me. Come on, somebody. you got to get it in your spirit. This is the day the Lord has made. And just a minute one thing. I want it today to lead me to good success. As it was written about David of old let it be in our own lives. 1 Samuel chapter 18 14 and David had success in all his undertakings for the Lord was with him. This ought to be in our life also. That my success comes from the Lord being in me doing and blessing, I should say, what I am doing. Because I am doing what he wants to bless. And the next verse reads in 1 Samuel 18, 15. And when Saul saw that he had, watch this, great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. Now we don't have time to get off on on, on sorry, uh, insecure Saul, his insecurity, his spiritual train wreck, his jealousy, that's kind of beyond the scope of this sermon at the moment. We're not going to throw any javelins at at, at the camera. Can I get a witness? But realize that within this verse, we have the proclamation of David's success as being good success and godly success. 
In fact, not only is it called good success, uh, but it's called great success. Uh, and even a carnal king uh, who was heading away from God uh, and who would really become the definition of bad success, uh, even somebody that carnal could clearly see uh, that God is blessing David, uh, that God is favoring David. Oh, God, uh, that's the kind of success I want in my life, uh, the kind of success that keeps my family together, uh, the kind of success that keeps my children loving me uh, as we grow old together, uh, the kind of success that brings people to God. Uh, and brings God to people. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what I want. Amen. I want good success that becomes great because God is the author and the finisher of it. So if this is what you want, then our texts become very important because they are the two places in Scripture where they teach a lesson on how to attain good success. Y'all with me? I'm preaching to you about finding Good success. We don't have time to get into a word study of this. I'll just quote people that are smarter than me. This verse translates, these verses I should say, in the Hebrew, it's the same word in both, in both uh, places, both Proverbs and both Joshua. It's a euphemism of wisdom that uses a big word that I can't pronounce to translate those terms good success. And in doing so, they perfectly capture the thought process of the original text. Our first text is Moses charged to Joshua. Moses is fixing to die. Moses is fixing to pass from this life as it were. These are words to Joshua. Joshua, take these things, do these things so that you will be, and Joshua did, take the people in the promised land and became a good success. Somebody say amen. And then our second text is the uh, master teacher instructing his student in godly wisdom and key principles of it but they work together to teach us what it takes for my life not to just be successfully, but be good, goodly successful. And so what it takes to be like David and Joshua and Daniel rather than Saul and Jonah and Lot. So I'm preaching to you directly now. I had to pause for a moment to get my breath because I am fat. But I, I am now got my wind back and I'm ready to move forward. Are you with me? Amen. And the first thing that I'm preaching to you directly is that we should note from these texts that define good success that first of all, spiritual consistency is necessary for good success to happen. Spiritual consistency. Moses at 120 years of age he knew a thing or two about leading uh, he admonished Joshua in our text Joshua 1 and 7 uh, only be strong and very courageous be careful to do according to all actually it's God speaking to Joshua I'm sorry only be strong and very courageous be careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you uh, do not turn from it listen to what God tells Joshua do not turn from it to the right hand I wish you'd preach to me say to the right hand uh, or to the left it always messes you up when a preacher does that because you're going that way and I'm going this way but it don't really matter yeah one way or the other do not turn from it God says to the right hand or to the left uh, that you may have good success wherever you go Joshua you're the leader Joshua you're taking people in the promised land uh, Joshua I want you to know you can make it uh, you can survive God's not going to call you to something uh, and set you up for failure I feel led to say it again uh, God's not going to call you to something uh, and set you up uh, for failure but Joshua if God chose you to follow Moses, uh, you can do it. You can make it. Uh, only you've got to make sure you do certain things. Uh, you take this word. Uh, you take these things that I've commanded you uh, and do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have good success uh, wherever you go. Uh, that phrase don't turn. Uh, don't go to the right. Uh, don't turn to the left uh, is the key for the blessings uh, of God and the favor of God uh, are long term endeavors. Uh, that whether a success in your life is good or bad, it's not determined by just one temporary decision in the right direction on any given day. But whether you have good success or not is determined by the sum of decisions made one after the other, day after day, week after week, year after year, that when they joined together, they took you a particular place and it was either a good or a bad success. Now listen, the highway of holiness is narrow. 
The will of God is a very narrow thing. Uh, the, the way that leads to eternal life, Jesus says, has a very, very tight gate, uh, and it's a very narrow course. Are you with me? Uh, amen. We, every day, uh, every moment, really, every minute, uh, we are at least going somewhere left or right. It's like taking a, a walk with my dog through the neighborhood. Uh, my wife hates to take our 83-pound lab pit bull mix uh, uh, on a walk uh, because either she or I have to carry her uh, because she will carry the girls down the street uh, because she's an 83 pound uh, uh, big ball of fur and muscle and, and she's stronger than she realizes and so we have to hold on to her uh, but Brownie uh, who is the name of our lo- beloved 83 pound lab uh, cannot walk in a straight line uh, Brownie cannot go from this point to that point straight on uh, but Brownie constantly is doing this uh, in front of you, you can't walk uh, and be growing up with her my girls have learned to walk from Brownie uh, my girls cannot walk in a straight line uh, if we're walking through the mall. Uh, They're constantly coming in front of you or whatever uh, because Brownie has taught them apparently to walk. Uh, Can I tell you that really uh, when you walk somewhere, uh, you really don't walk much in a straight line either. Uh, But if you keep your eyes on where you're going, uh, you constantly make just little adjustments. Uh, When you're learning to drive as a a young person, like certain people that I'm not going to mention in this audience are, uh, you got to look not where you are. uh, you got to look where you're going. Uh, Don't look at daddy who's screaming at you in the seat next to you. Uh, You just got to keep it forward. Am I feeling a little conviction over here? Uh, you got to look way in front of you. Uh, oh, it's mom screaming, okay? And, and, and you got to make little minute adjustments uh, because nobody really ever passes in a straight line. Uh, you're constantly, can I, can I get a witness, uh, that every day I've got to check my attitude. Uh, every day I've got to check my spirit. Uh, every day I've got to check my mindset. Uh, every day I've got to check my direction. Uh, every hour uh, I've got to check my attitude. Uh, every hour I've got to check my spirit. Every minute uh, I've got to check my decisions Uh, every minute I've got to check because the way I'm going to get to heaven uh, is by making constant little corrections uh, to stay balanced uh, in the middle of the plan of God uh, and the highway of holiness but this commandment from God that don't turn to the right or to the left he's not talking about little adjustments He's speaking of something else altogether. He, he, he's talking about people who only do right for a little time. And then their little season of doing right is quickly followed by a full turn into sin. Can I preach to somebody today? It means people who make a resolve at repentance. I'm going to live differently this time. But they only keep that commitment and that resolve for a short brief season and then they return again and again and again to what they repented of. That this admonition of Scripture to not turn to the right or to the left uh, is speaking of people who only serve God in spurts. uh, People who are only fully devoted to the things of God at times. uh, And people who only fully do uh, what God courageously and directly do uh, want them to do uh, for small snippets of their life. And those who say, I'm going to live for God, but then a week later, suddenly they've turned to the left or to the right. And what he's telling us is that good success can only come about if we're faithful to God, faithful to his word, faithful to his callings, consistently through multiple seasons and even years of our life. doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but it does mean if you want to see the true fruit of righteousness, you've got to be consistent and not wishy-washy. I think about King Saul, y'all with me? Who along with Lot, they are the twin poster boys of defining what a bad success is. And I want you to realize that King Saul, the Old Testament Saul, was anointed of God, but in the end, it led to his destruction and not his salvation. I want you to realize that the same prophet who anointed David first also anointed Saul. But the difference in how they turned out uh, was that what David did in prolonged, consistent seasons, uh, Saul only did uh, in temporary short burst. uh, That Saul prophesied. Saul did. uh, Saul prophesied uh, with the prophets uh, when the Spirit of God came over him. uh, He did that once. uh, Amen. Saul built an altar occasionally. uh, Saul consulted the Lord 
every now and then and not always before he had made up his mind and, and, and more or less sometimes he consulted the Lord and then did what he wanted to do anyway even if he, if he say why bother right Saul obeyed the Lord some but not completely at any one time in his life. Saul was never ever consistent for a long period of time and the result was a spiritual train wreck of a man who was head and shoulders above Israel gifted to lead Israel and chosen by God to be their first king and yet became a God reject and the definition of a bad success. Can I tell somebody thank God that David wasn't perfect I'm not, I'm not glorifying his mistakes. I'm not ever happy that anybody messes up. But David was not perfect. But his spiritual walk with God was not characterized by Charlie Brown wishy-washiness either. David did not constantly spend his whole life vacillating between serving the Lord and serving himself. David had a handful of memorable mistakes. You know about Bathsheba. You probably, some of you know about the, the mess with the census and we won't get into that today. Amen. But I want you to understand that despite his imperfections and despite his faults that David's default mode was to serve the Lord. David's default mode was when he messed up he would come back to God. He would truly humble himself. He would repent and then he would give himself back to his default mode of living a life of consecration and worship. The difference between David and Saul, amen, in their life was what their default mode was. What it was that they tended to return to again and again in life. David's default mode was one of submission, one of obedience, one of worship to God. But Saul's default mode was one of self-reliance, one of disobedience, one of fear of the people that came from the sin in his heart. Saul worshiped God every now and then. But then eventually he would come back and default to his carnal nature. David made some mistakes here and there but then eventually he would default to his heart that was like unto God's and his desire to please God. He would say after one of his best worst, depending on how you look at it mess ups, he would say God create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me and he would never commit adultery again. Are, are you with me here? That David ended up blessed despite Despite not being perfect uh, because, amen, good success uh, is not determined by one or two mistakes or sins or mistakes or, or times you fail, uh, but good success is determined uh, by what you tend to do uh, over the long run. Uh, what is the default mode for your life? Uh, is it to keep God's commandments and try to live for him uh, or occasionally in small spurts? Uh, is it a series of little commitments that last a week or two, uh, amen, that follow a conference or follow a good service? and then in two weeks you're right back to the same uh, non-commitment lifestyle you were uh, or is your default mode to worship him in humble repentance uh, despite the occasional mistake or human error uh, if you want to have spiritual success uh, you've got to be consistent uh, in your walk with God uh, you've got to prove to God uh, amen that if he takes you back uh, you're going to love him uh, you're going to serve him uh, and you're going to help hallelujah you know, some people spend decades of their life. I need to be careful here because I'm pastoring, but I'm also on the WWW. Some people in general between the Atlantic and the Pacific, between Canada and long live Mexico, spend decades of their life living for their ideals. Just I'm speaking in general here, of course. But if you feel conviction, you're the general. They spend, <laughs> they spend, don't egg me on, it just makes me try harder. They spend years giving into principles of sin. And then, if they were to temporarily step out on a promise of God's word, for 48 hours, if God does not swoop into their life, and undo and change all of the stuff they planted for decades, then in their estimation, God is a failure. And I talk to people like that and I think, eh, that's not really how the principles of God really work. God doesn't bless you just what you do occasionally. God really blesses you and what you reap long term is a sum of the product of what the default mode is in your life. Y'all with me here? 
we don't have time to get off on this, and your giving's actually been very good during this time. Thank you for that, but I'll just use tithes and offering as an opportunity. What God doesn't say is, if you'll pay tithes and offering to support missionaries, that I will come in and immediately erase all your debt that you spend four decades of accumulating, and that I will erase all of these spending habits. Come on now. And all your bills will be paid and your mother-in-law will be happy and all your financial troubles will be settled. That's not what he says. And he definitely doesn't say it will all happen in a 48-hour period. Well, Pastor, I paid my tithes and I haven't got a $500 check yet. Well, hang on. The government's just handing out money. It's printing money. So there's a good chance you can have a check in the mail. But, but that's not really how the principles of God works. Now, what he does say is that if you will prove him on these things, come on somebody, that over the coming weeks and months and years, God will prove himself to you uh, to show you that he'll be faithful. Uh, he did say he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake, uh, that he'll provide to you amply in a way that does take care of all the other. But I want you to realize the promises of God tend to be long term uh, and not some instant self-gratification. Hello? somebody I could take any other promise of God's word and most of his commandments and they're this way I, I'm grateful here's my disclaimer I'm grateful that God sometimes hears us instantly I'm grateful I'm grateful that I serve a God this kind of blows my mind to be honest with you because if I were God I wouldn't be this way so aren't you glad that you and I aren't God but I serve a God who can have somebody curse him on one day uh, amen and live in such a way as to bring reproach to his name all of their life uh, walk into a church uh, lift up their hands, uh, genuinely believe, uh, genuinely repent, uh, obey the commandment to get baptized in Jesus' name, uh, and God will miraculously fill them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I've seen them all happen within the space of an hour. Now, aren't you glad I ain't God because I wouldn't be doing that. I'd be making sure they had to, they had to go through some criteria and some checklists. Uh, and aren't you glad you ain't God because you'd probably be the same way. Uh, can I get a witness? Uh, if you and I were God, one of us probably wouldn't be in church today. Amen. Because the other one wouldn't let the other one come. But I want to tell somebody, we serve a God who sometimes responds to us instantly. He's merciful. He doesn't give us what we fully deserve. Uh, he'll turn to us in an instant. I praise God for that. Uh, amen. Thank God for that. Uh, but I want you to understand in all of that in all of learning about God's graciousness and God's mercy yet don't make the mistake of always judging God's great promises on the basis of instant results or a week's worth of obedience that those who produce bad success they always have this track record I worship God some but then I don't I'm spotty in my, my giving I'm spotty in my worship I'm spotty in my obedience I try it for a little while and quit no 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 if you you want to have good success. Uh, amen. Um, God told Joshua, don't turn to the left uh, and don't turn to the right. Uh, there's got to be some consistency. Uh, you got to get a hold of your promise uh, and you got to say, it doesn't matter what comes. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I get an instant reply in 48 hours. Uh, it doesn't matter if everything's fixed immediately. I'm going to cling to that promise. You can't have good success in anything. If one thing is priority one day, and then something totally different is priority the next. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. You're going to love one thing over the other is the problem. You cannot pursue your ministry wholeheartedly for a week and then pursue something else the next week and expect to have good success in your God-given ministry. You can't be on, come on, preaching to somebody today to be a little more consistent. You need to get enough word in you uh, to say, you know what, it doesn't matter what I feel today. It uh, doesn't matter what my emotions or my blood sugar is telling me. It uh, doesn't matter what the storms are on the horizon. Uh, I'm going to stick to the guns uh, of the principles of the word of God uh, that's going to outlast this world. Uh, you got to make up in your mind. I'm not going to be on fire for God this month uh, and then not even found at church the next uh, when we can assemble ourselves together. Uh, you can't be involved in the kingdom of God for half of the year uh, and then in this continuous continual cycle uh, where for the rest of the half the year you're disconnected from God's purpose. Uh, it takes continual consistency in spiritual endeavors uh, to see uh, the full favor of God to make your way into a good success. Uh, it doesn't take perfection, uh, but it does make up a mind uh, that you got to say, you know what? Uh, amen. I got a made up mind. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I want to tell somebody for a church uh, to be the full church, uh, to be fully what it should be. Uh, amen. It needs uh, a consistent 
consistent uh, prevailing direction uh, and it needs a consistent and prevailing doctrine uh, and it needs a sure sound uh, from the leadership uh, and the saints. Uh, amen. You can have a church uh, and be successful uh, but if you want the church to be good successful, uh, if you want it to be a good success uh, where it fills in, uh, there's got to be a consistency uh, over the long haul. Uh, you can't be on fire for God uh, and on fire for souls for one week uh, and then compromise in your convictions the next. Uh, you can't be on fire for God one come on somebody uh, every church that's ever impacted the kingdom of God uh, has this record uh, it has both the preacher uh, and it has people saints who joined to that preacher uh, who said we're going to stand for truth uh, we're going to stay true uh, we're going to stay on fire uh, it's not just going to be a season of revival and then we're gone uh, it's going to be a consistent thing uh, that our life to prioritize it. you want your family to reap the great blessings of God you cannot be worshiping God on the mountainside one day and then moving into Sodom the next. If you want an apostolic ministry and the fullness of what God has for you, you can't have that and the fullness of the world at the same time. That's the legacy of Laodicea. That's the legacy of Lot. That's the legacy of Demas. I don't want that legacy. I want good success. Hallelujah. Leads to something else. Hey, video person, how long have I been preaching? 35 minutes, I'm doing good. Feeling chipper. That's kind of nice to have him over in the corner. I can ask how long I've been preaching. Ain't no clock in here, you know. There is. There's a clock down there. But who knows what time or day it is. I have no idea. <laughs> Leaves me something else in these texts. I'm preaching to you about good success. Y'all still with me? Y'all still with me at home? Let me hear you. Let me hear you. Send me a text if you're at home. I'm, I'm kidding if it's 3 in the morning. If it's not 3 in the morning, you send me a text. There's something else in this key ingredient to genuine, godly, and good success. we got to be spiritually consistent. And there's the second thing. We've got to daily fill our minds with godliness and thinking about God's kingdom. The word to Joshua in our text was not to turn to the left or the right from the law of God that Moses had written down and handed to him. Y'all with me here? He then told him in Joshua 1 and 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Everybody say, you can't stop speaking about it. But you shall, watch this, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. What he's saying is, Joshua, you've got to be purposeful about filling your mind with godliness. What he's telling us is, is you've got to make it your purpose to make yourself think continually about God's kingdom. He says meditate on it. Now, to meditate in the Bible does not tra- call up uh, d- doesn't call up this transcendental meditation born of eastern religion. It's not some monk, you know, going breaking boards with his nose or whatever. That that that's not what that's not what it's saying. But in the Bible, the the context of meditation means to purposefully think and cause the mind to dwell upon something. To meditate in the Bible means to prayerfully consider something continually. That you're only going to have good success if we meditate and purposefully think upon the book. And by the book, he means the written word of God. You know, for you to be able to think on God's word, you've got to first put it within your mind. You know what I mean? It's impossible to think about something and continually ponder over something that you don't know. Proverbs 3 and 2, we're told to take the teaching of the commandment of scriptures and to bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. That is to say that we've got to hear them and then we've got to learn them and then we've got to memorize them and once we get an in us, we've got to make it a point to, to purposefully think about them. Once they're there, we've got to make it a point to constantly bring them back up and continually. You don't need your pastor to preach something new that you never heard of every time you come to church. Every now and then you need the pastor to go back over the same old stuff because you're going to be saved and be a good success by meditating on the commandments of God day and night. That means every now and then you need somebody to remind Mind you of some things that's been a while since you thought about. Amen. Joshua's command was very specific. You need to talk about them continually. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, right? 
Put it in your mind's eye. Put it at the forefront of your mind's eye. I'm talking about the book, the Word of God. So let me ask you a simple but very loaded question. And we are recording. So those of you that make up our live audience, please do not answer out loud because it will be recorded for all to hear. But in your mind, answer this question. What is it in your life that you most often think about? Please don't answer out loud. I was waiting. We would turn the audio up to hear what you whispered. And then there's another question. What is it that you most often talk about? Because those two are probably related. And then I got a third question for you. What is it that you most often put into your mind through the gateway of your eyes and your ears? Because that probably is the answer to all three questions. Is it the word of God? Is it the kingdom of God? When you go by to work, I know you got to think of other things, like not slapping the coworker across from you. But you were going to invite to, to witness this video, but now you're under conviction you can't invite them because you know they're going to ask you if they're that coworker. If you have to ask anybody in our church if you're the coworker, you are the coworker. Please change, sir or ma'am, before you get slapped. Can I get a witness? But as you're thinking about stuff at work, come on now, I know it's kind of a humbling question. Do the things of God ever come across your mind? Or is that just something for church? I know you got to think of other things. Let me help some of you out. Red light means stop. Not burn through the stop sign 60 miles an hour like this lady did to me yesterday in our neighborhood. That little red octagon thing means stop. I know you dyslexic and you thought it said pots, but it said stop. Yellow means slow down, not speed up, Texas. And just for the record, if you're from Castroville, if you're coming from the golf course and you come up to this little light on top of the hill, there are two red lights, which means there are two lanes there, which means if you're turning left to go to San Antonio, get all the way over so us who are turning right to go to Hondo can get by and don't have to wait on the whole people. You're welcome. This is a customer service announcement from the Jesus Church to Castroville, Texas. And green means go. Not let me check my text messages. Put my phone down, wipe my nose, and then get my car in, in gear and wait for somebody to honk at me. When it turns green, go for goodness sakes. You got to think about some things in life. But in the middle of your driving and texting, in the middle of blocking both the lanes when there's obviously two red lights in front of you, in the middle of trying to overcome the, the things at work and your coworker, does it ever cross your mind, I'm a child of God? Does it ever cross your mind that I'm redeemed? Uh, does it ever cross your mind uh, that their blood's gonna be on my hands uh, if they never hear the light of Jesus Christ uh, emanating from my life or see it? Uh, does it ever cross your mind? Uh, come on now, uh, I'm preaching to somebody today uh, that the only way you're going to be a good success uh, is no matter what else I'm doing, uh, no matter if I'm at a red light or I'm at work, uh, if I'm at home or at church, uh, if I'm around family or friends or enemies, uh, there's got to be a constant pervading thought uh, that the Word of God uh, is the governing force of my life. Uh, the Spirit of God uh, is the directive uh, that impacts it uh, in my life and causes me to apply it uh, properly. Uh, come on now, uh, amen. What is it you think of? about the most? What is it that you can't stop thinking about? What is it you're so passionate uh, that you stay up at night sometime and think about? Uh, is it money? Uh, come on, come on. Is it, is it drugs? Uh, is it sports that you've been deprived of? Uh, is it a fantasy world because of the books and the movies and the games and the media that you're constantly feeding yourself? Uh, is it a social reach uh, or a social relationship with somebody? Uh, or are we consumed to the point uh, that the kingdom of God uh, and Jesus Christ uh, and his work in us I know we've got to live in this world. It's okay to be a fan of a sports team. It's okay to have a hobby and other interests. But can I tell you, that can't be our passion. That can't be our primary focus. It cannot be all we talk about. It can't be all we think about. I've got to make the commandments and the prior... The truth is, you can tell by people listening... To you and you to them, what they're passionate about. 
It's not just what people talk about. It's what causes their eyes to light up when they talk about it. Some people can talk about God, but apparently their God is dead because their eyes are just glossy over. Come on, somebody. Truth is, out of the abundance of a heart, the mouth speaks. It's Matthew 12, 34. Y'all with me? The truth is, is what you speak about passionately and what you think about the most is what you put in your mind. Garbage in, garbage out. You know, people, people often quote Proverbs 3. Some of you thought I was going there when I read my text. Proverbs 3 and, and 5, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 is what everybody goes to. Verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. I don't know if I said that right. Proverbs 3 and 5 is what I'm reading. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. How many of you that are here, you've heard the scripture before. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. That's a great scripture. That's great advice. But people sometimes forget. Listen to me. Listen to this, Pastor. It's impossible to do Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 unless you're first doing verses 1 through 4. My son, verse 1, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Uh, let your heart, let your mind, let what you're passionate about, let your thoughts, let it be on my commandments. Uh, you got to put them in the center of your, of your mind, uh, and you got to make sure they occupy first place in your thoughts. Uh, he goes on to tell us to bind them around your neck, uh, write them on the tablet of your heart. Uh, it's impossible to trust the Lord with all your heart uh, when your heart is filled uh, and focused on other things uh, besides what the the Lord is telling you uh, and commanding you to do. Uh, it's impossible uh, to not lean on your own understanding uh, when it's only worldly and self-filled thoughts, uh, amen, uh, that are the things that you are understand uh, and the things that are present within you uh, and that's all you're putting in your life. Uh, I want to remind somebody it's impossible or at least very, very hard uh, to acknowledge him in all your ways uh, when your thoughts uh, don't acknowledge him, uh, when your thoughts uh, are not really pleasing to him. I want you to realize today that there is a direct correlation but thinking continually on the things of God and feeding your life the things of God and responding and feeling the presence of the Lord. I see young people and I see older people alike. They come into the house of the Lord and God's presence sweeps in during a song. It sweeps in during a message. It sweeps in during an altar service. God is walking through that place in spirit form. He's as close so much that I feel I can taste him. And that sounds weird, but he's there. I know he's there. And I'm moved because I've been seeking all week for that. And now here he is. And I look up sometime at young people and even adults, and usually they're kin. May have to edit that from the video. Maybe not. Maybe we should leave it. Amen. And the Spirit of God is moving. And they're zoned. They're bored. God Almighty is here. They don't even realize it. They're checking their phone. They're looking at their watch. The God of glory has descended there. He's moving. He's, he's helping people. He's helping people overcome addictions. Uh, he's helping people overcome hurts. Uh, he's helped people are lost in the spirit uh, and they're just sitting there. Let me tell you the difference is uh, it's because all week uh, they fed their mind with media. They fed their mind with sports. Uh, they fed their mind with this social thing or that video or this deal. Uh, they've been watched this show. Uh, they put all this God godliness in their life. Uh, and so when it comes to church, uh, they can't even, they, they don't even realize uh, that they're missing, uh, amen, something that everybody else is feeling uh, because they're so desensitized to it uh, they can't even detect the presence of the Lord uh, can I tell somebody today uh, amen if your habits outside of church uh, keep you from even being aware that the presence of the Lord is real uh, then there needs to be some things cut out of your life uh, if you say uh, come on now uh, if you're battling something uh, if you're battling an addiction uh, if you're battling a sin you can't overcome uh, what you really need to do uh, is get to the root of the problem uh, and trace what you're putting in your life uh, what you're taking in through the gate of your eye and your ears uh, Amen. If you're always depressed, uh, turn the news off. Uh, stop gossiping with the people whom you gossip. Uh, if you're always dealing with lust, uh, kill your internet connection. Uh, stop looking at the mess you're looking and get an accountability partner. Uh, if you're always dealing with depression, uh, come on somebody. Uh, amen. You've got to push aside the stuff that you're listening to uh, and you're opening yourself up to uh, and you've got to say, you know what? Uh, it's time to open up the book. Uh, it's time to turn back to some problems.
promises. It's time to get back in touch with the kingdom of God. It's time, come on now, if my marriage is always on the rocks, maybe my problem is my relationship with the king of kings and the Lord of lords because my relationship this way is always going to be a mirror of this way. If I'm always at odds with people, maybe I need to get this right. Maybe I need to focus more on this and push aside some other things. got to meditate on God's word what we put in our mind the most consistently what we put in our our mind the most often determines how we think and how we think determines how we'll eventually act and how we act determines our habits and our default mode and our habits and our default mode determine what we reap in the long term and even eternity you got a lot of voices speaking to you. But if you want the Lord to make straight your path, if you want the Lord to make sure you're a good success, you can't do any of that until you take his commandments. Hallelujah. The psalmist told us another place in Psalms 15, 1. He said, O oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He's talking about the house of God, the temple, the presence of God. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. I wish you would say that with me. Say, speaks truth in his heart. That's a figure of speech meaning for what you tell yourself with the voice of your conscience. What that little voice is is blabbering. How many have a voice in your head that talks a lot? Brother Jason, yours talks a lot? I'm a little amazed by that. We're not talking about your wife or your kids. We're talking about you, right? There's a little voice in your head that talks a lot? That's amazing. Yeah. Does he talk a lot at home? We won't get into that. He talks to himself. Only way he can get intelligent conversations is what I tell my family. What that voice says, I distracted him and then moved quickly. He can't. What that voice says in your life over and over again is a result of what you're feeding it. Some people say, well, I can't overcome this voice. It's telling me I can't. It's telling me I can't. It's an issue of what's been fed into your mind. If you would meditate on the, on the, uh, come on, somebody. I'm trying to help somebody deliver, amen, deliver you from some things. Uh, thank God for counseling. Thank God for all those things. But let me tell you something. You're never really going to get victory over the issues of your life uh, until you begin to focus day and night on the word of God uh, and say, I'm going to take the Lord's report over any other. Uh, what God has said is what I'm going to believe. Uh, that's who's going to be comfortable in his presence. Uh, that's who God's going to establish in his house. Uh, those who speak truth in his heart. Uh, you got to speak it over and over and over and over and over. Come on somebody. Uh, hey man, let me, let me throw something at you. We ain't got time to deal with it because the video guy's going to start pulling my coattail. Uh, amen. But let me remind you of something. Uh, in Noah's day, uh, it was because uh, you know why God destroyed the heaven and earth? What does the Bible say? Uh, what does the Bible actually say uh, of why God destroyed the heaven and the earth? Uh, it says because he saw, listen, uh, he saw that it was on man's heart uh, to do evil continually. Uh, It wasn't just what they were doing. Come on now, uh, amen. But it was the fact that their thought process told him uh, that there wasn't going to be any changes anytime soon. Uh, Can I tell somebody, uh, it's not just what you do uh, that determines God's action to you in your life. Uh, It's what God sees when he sees your heart. Uh, It's what God sees uh, when he hears your mind. Uh, When God tunes into your thoughts. Uh, When God tunes into your priorities. Uh, It's not just what you say. Uh, It's not just what front you put up for the preacher or for other people. uh, But when God tunes into your heart and your mind, uh, does he look at somebody that makes him want to bless them? uh, Or is it somebody that's going to bring judgment? Uh, Oh, God, when you look into my heart, uh, when you hear the thoughts of my life, uh, I want, God, my heart to be like your heart. Uh, He'll he'll get you through mistakes. Uh, It'll get you through faults. Uh, It'll get you through family issues. Uh, You can make it because when God is convinced uh, that he knows your heart uh, and your heart is toward him. God will bless you and God will help you through all the other. It's what it takes for good success. How long have I been going, video guy? Stand up with me, please, those that are here. There's a third and final thing here because the term meditate means to prayerfully consider continually in the scripture. I would tell the people at home I've been cooped up, so I'm preaching a little longer than normal. But the truth is, I'm preaching about like I usually do. 
I just get excited for the things of God. You're so addicted to sports that you're disappointed that the NFL draft is over. Three hours of listening to people read names. And this sermon's too long. Your priorities are off. Just a thought. You've been filling yours. That's why you're dead spiritually. To have good success, there's a third thing. Prayer creates a renewed appetite. Prayer causes increased capacity for spiritual things. Now I'm all about prayer. But we make a grave mistake when we think a personal prayer time is only being about God giving us stuff. Prayer is about that, but it's about more than that. Because it's about relationship. But prayer is also about our capacity to receive and hunger for Him and His kingdom. Prayer gives us influence with God. Prayer allows us to come boldly before His throne of grace. I know all those scriptures. But prayer also changes us to create in us a space that God can fill with greater blessing and greater anointing. It increases our capacity, which is to say our ability to hold more of what God has for us. You know why some people can't receive all that God wants to give them? It's because they have not prepared themselves. This is a very powerful concept. We don't have time to do this justice today. I, I, I've already been preaching 56 minutes, 55 minutes now. That the reason God can't give them everything he wants to give them is because they haven't prepared themselves to take on the capacity to hold what God will give them. And he will not give us more than we can bear. It's a great truth that when we get away from personal daily sacrifice in our relationship with God, that God begins to diminish in our mind's eye and our life outlook. I really don't have time to do this justice, but there is a, there is a conspicuous absence of altars being built in Genesis chapter 16. There's, a cha- there's an altar in Genesis chapter 15 in Abraham's life. There's a communication with God in chapter 17 of the book of Genesis. But in chapter 16 in Abraham's life, there's a notable and conspicuous absence. You say, well, that's not really a big deal until you read the chapter and you realize that it is a time period of over 13 years in Abraham's life encompassed in Genesis 16. For 13 years, there's no recorded communication between Abraham and God. For 13 years... He didn't build an altar. For 13 years, he didn't offer a sacrifice. Come on, somebody. You say, well, what happens in chapter 17? Well, what happens after that chapter of a lack of of altar in Abraham's life is that then when God comes back to him, uh, that lack of prayer, that lack of personal sacrifice is Ishmael and Hagar. and Then God shows up and Abraham and then Sarah both laugh at the God of the universe telling them what's fixing to happen. See, our perspective can block God out to us. How many of you have ever walked out on a sunshiny day and forgot your, your sunglasses or you're like me, your ears are uneven so sunglasses look stupid on you and you walk outside and the sun's shining and, and you, you take your hand and you block out the sun. Anybody ever done it? And you're like, well, my hand can blot out the sun. Not really, just from your perspective. Prayerlessness and a lack of a daily sacrifice and making it priority in our life. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Set us up to begin to look that God is impotent in our life. To us, it seems like God, He's not, but to us, from our perspective, it seems that God is broke and that God can't do everything. A lack of prayer creates a false perceptive in your life of what God is wanting and able to do because prayer creates a capacity for what God can do. Joshua was a good success. We've already covered this. Because not only did he continually and consistently obey, follow the Lord, but he also was found often at the house of God and he kept the commandments of God. And he was found speaking with God. So it is, and here's how I close, with Daniel. Daniel is probably one of the greatest successes in the Bible, the greatest example of a good success. If Saul and Lot were the poster boys of bad success, then Daniel is the poster boy or one of them for good success. How could Daniel, here's how we close today, 
How could Daniel live in Babylon? A godless heathen society surrounded by Babylonian things, surrounded by Babylonian culture, surrounded whether he was at home or at work, a Babylonian influence. And yet he never became infected, not just affected, infected with anything having to do with Babylon. How could that be? In, 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 in our minds, he was in one of the most precarious places in the world. He was a foreign national trying to serve God in the service of idolatrous and carnal kings. And in a place that most of us would think that's impossible for him to ever be established. Daniel was established. Daniel was flourishing. Daniel was blessed. And he stayed faithful to God. And the answer is, Daniel enacted those three things of our text that promises, God promises us, will lead us to good success. I want you to think of them. I'm going to give them quickly and we're going to end. Daniel was consistent in his devotion to the things of God. We read in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. I'm going to throw them out there quickly. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Literal, A literal translation of the Hebrew of that word resolved is literally in the Hebrew. It's placed on his heart. Daniel placed on his heart that he would not defile himself uh, with the king's food. Uh, it means that Daniel from the beginning of the matter said, I'm not going to do, how does he know that the king's food was, would defile him spiritually? Because he knew what Moses had written. Uh, he had read the word of God. So here we go. Uh, Daniel uh, makes up in his mind, I'm going to be consistent whether I'm in Babylon or not. Uh, whether I'm at home or I'm in a comfort zone or I'm not. Uh, whether I'm serving an idolatrous king or a godly king, uh, I'm going to be consistent with godly principles. Uh, and then I'm going to apply myself to the word of God uh, so that I know what pleases God and what doesn't please God. Uh, amen. He was constantly found reading and thinking uh, on the word of God. Uh, the Bible says in Daniel 1.17, they don't have it, uh, that Daniel was chosen first because of his learning and skill, quote, learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Uh, throughout the book of Daniel, uh, we have passages like this, Daniel 9 and 2. Uh, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, uh, perceived in the books uh, the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet uh, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, uh, namely 70 years. Uh, what does that mean? That means throughout, his, throughout the chapters, uh, you find Daniel's reading a word. Uh, he's reading what Moses said. Uh, he's following the commandments of God that God gave to Joshua. He's here reading the prophecy of Jeremiah who, who was very recent and even a contemporary at times in his life. He's reading the word of God. He's reading the scrolls. He's applying himself. So here you go, Daniel. You're in the worst possible place. You're, you've got everything against you. If there's any place where it's easy to backslide, being in Babylon and in your line of work, it is. But here's Daniel being faithful to God. Why? Because he's consistent day in and day out with his principles. Uh, he's already placed on his heart what he's going to live by uh, and he's continually in the word of God uh, and then here's the third thing uh, he's consistent with his prayers. Uh, we don't have time to go there uh, but when that little writ decree uh, was signed by the king that would eventually lead uh, to his encounter with the den uh, of lions, uh, amen, the Bible says uh, that Daniel went and prayed uh, he opened the window toward Jerusalem uh, he prayed to the God of heaven uh, just as he did uh, previously uh, just as he had all always done, amen, that the reason that Daniel, amen, had good success despite every, I want to tell somebody, it's not what's going to come against you in life that's going to determine whether you're good, successful or not, amen, it's not, amen, what comes against you, it's not your environment, it's not what you were born into, but it's how you respond to those things, and I want to tell you, if you'll take our text, you can be goodly consistent, and you can be goodly prayerful, come on somebody uh, and you can be apply yourself to the word of God uh, and those things will cause you to be goodly blessed uh, hallelujah highly favored uh, and a good success I want my life to end up more like David and Daniel and Joshua rather than Jonah and Saul and Lot but what will come about in my life is determine what I'm choosing to do now I don't want to do things that lead to bad success. I don't want to gain a world and lose my soul, my only soul. Hallelujah. But I'm going to take these texts. And if I'll do the things in them, 
you cannot help but find good and spiritual and godly success. Wherever you are, lift up your hands and receive the word of God today. Come on, let's ask God to reform our thoughts, our minds, our habits. Jesus, we ask God for your blessing. Hallelujah. God, you see the people under the sound of my voice. God, both in this building, God, in this small group of people, but also the people, God, that will be watching on Sunday night and even beyond. I pray, God, there will be something, God, that would get a hold of us. I pray, God, in the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, by the authority that you have given me, uh, that there are lives that will be changed, God, from this day forward. Uh, I pray, God, that somebody, God, will make up in their mind uh, to be steadfast in their convictions, uh, to be steadfast in truth. Uh, I pray, God, that somebody would turn back to the book, uh, the book, God, that has the real answers for the dilemmas of their life, uh, the book, oh God, which contains, oh God, uh, oh Lord, your word. Uh, I pray, God, that somebody would devote themselves to prayer, uh, that somebody would come back consistently God to seek in your face uh, I pray God that oh Lord there would be oh Lord the foundation and the building blocks uh, placed in somebody's life right now uh, that would lead to an apostolic ministry uh, that would lead God to good success in the secular world uh, not just worldly success uh, not just success at any cost uh, but God that oh Lord something will be put into the hearts of men and women today uh, young and old oh God uh, that God would lead to good success success. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, God, let it be, oh God, guide our steps uh, and guide us in the direction, oh God, that would be good in your sight, to your heart, God. We glorify you and we praise you. We honor you, God, and we surrender to you. Let us be sensitive to your presence. Let us be sensitive to the things, oh God, which you are calling us to. We glorify you. We honor you, Lord. We submit to you. Hallelujah. Let my name glorify you. Let my name praise your name above else. Above anything else in my life, God, it's not my name that's important they remember. It's your name, God. Hallelujah. Mm. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost here. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. I feel such a strong witness of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, let us, God, have faith, oh, God, in your process. Let us have faith in your plan, God. Hallelujah. Let us know, God, that you have our future mapped and our course charted. And God, let us align ourselves with what you're going to bless not just ask you to bless us what we're doing. Father, we glorify you. Hallelujah. We can end the video here for those at home. Why don't you take a moment and pray at home? Why don't you take a moment and surrender to God? And if there be anything in your life that's out of his will or take you to the left or the right or causing you to, to miss out on the opportunities of his presence. Why don't you push those things aside and why don't you worship him in spirit and truth? And we'll be praying with you. Amen. Meanwhile, those of you that are here, why don't we lift up our hands and respond to the presence of the Lord. There's a deep move of the Holy Ghost that just walked into this place. Lord, we ask God for your purpose. We ask God that you would be established.